Well, thank you very much. And um, I obviously feel like a fraud in, bunch, uh, in front of a bunch of uh, actual farmers. Um, and I was very conscious when I was uh, discussing the opportunity to come and talk today that this is a view um, from the city. I'm not sure exactly from the city, but hopefully from a number of points of view, uh, looking into the farming industry, because it is an industry. This is a set of businesses in a complex globally driven price uh, sort of field with, with lots of very complicated, increasingly global supply chains, all of which I've had some experience of, of being involved with. Now, I'm coming here um, slightly weird. I don't think I've ever actually been sponsored by a competitor before, but this is, this is much better than, <laughs> it's a lot better than paying it for yourself. So thank you, M&S. Um, so I'm here really with sort of the first out, Barclays UK, which is banks, hopefully about 25% of the country's farmer, farmers, and has been doing so and had a specialist agricultural unit since 1744, slightly more recently set up a specialist agri-tech uh, unit, and is fundamentally committed to the future of farming in the UK and the role that farming plays in the communities across the UK. So we are passionate supporters. Secondly, um, I've been involved in business uh, sort of 35 years, mostly as retailers, not directly in the food business, but certainly involved in forestry and sustainability across that period and so very interested in, in how this sector works and contributes. Um, then also uh, wearing the government hat, um, I'm effectively one of about 80 uh, non-exec directors around um, uh, government who are also trying to work out how the Brexit uh, actual landing is gonna go and how the various departments can support it, including obviously Henry uh, from uh, DEFRA, who I think you heard of. Um, but also I'm, I'm here as a chair, um, and a deliberately independent chair of the Food Farming uh, Countryside Commission which is a two-year inquiry to think about the global um, and integrated nature of those issues around what type of uh, food uh, industry do we want, what type of countryside do we want, and how does it affect uh, other issues which aren't maybe technically seen as part of the rural affairs uh, agenda, notably public health. And I'm really pleased that we're halfway through that process and we'll be reporting back and we've uh, issued an interim report. But, that, that in, in terms of any questions, I'm very happy to answer uh, anything except on Christmas trading, uh, which is currently uh, under, under uh, <coughs> strict purda, um, but probably not as bad as everyone thought it was going to be. Um, in terms of uh, the three topics that I would like just to talk about uh, in, in the brief period of the chat, is there are three themes I see from a sort of business city perspective when I look into the farming industry and, and the broader areas that were represented here. Um, the first is unprecedented change. I know everyone talks about this, but I genuinely think the world economy, for a variety of reasons, even before we get to Brexit, is accelerating uh, its rate of change. And it's, very, it's the hardest thing for businesses to do, once they're successful at one thing, is to think about how they change. So one of the roles I'm very keen on, the boards I sit on, is to hammer away at people saying, look, you're doing brilliantly, but I'm afraid that was then, and then the future's in, you know, going to be different. And I'll come back to some of those, uh, some of those drivers of that change. The second is um, why, in all businesses, but I think particularly in this business, uh, something we've heard on before, it's critical to focus on your customers. And I know it's a, a really motherhood statement, particularly coming from a retailer. That's all we do. We're, we're sort of goldfish-like about it. Just keep thinking about it. But here in, in this industry, you have a genuinely different... Uh, player, when we talk about customer, the way I think about customers for, for the farming world is yes, there is the direct customer, but there's quite often a very complicated supply chain that you can't, don't often sort of see all the way through to the end of. But also, you've got a customer in the shape of um, the public, and the public who are paying subsidies, who are increasingly thinking now post CAP in the UK, what is it they're going to pay for, the public goods, for public money for public goods? And I would encourage you to think about that as a customer in a different way than your sort of direct financial customer. But both of those are critically important. And then the final piece is, is to say that everywhere I look in the economy, all around the UK, uh, all the regions I, I, get, I get around a lot, courtesy of Barclays, uh, the two themes I keep coming back to in the business world, uh, which will play out, I'm sure, in, ter in terms of farming, are resilience and adapt adaptability. And again, they're quite easy things to say, but I think more and more, if you're running a business of any size, if you haven't fundamentally sat down and thought about your business model in terms of your resilience, your true diversity, and your ability to adapt and change and build in change 
as opposed to treat change as something which is just miserable and is going to be done unto you. You'll be missing, missing a real trick. And I think the successful businesses that I see a lot of uh, around, around the UK are positively working out how they move forward rather than simply get into a bunker and try and work out how to defend what they've got. So just briefly on those three topics, uh, in, in terms of how I think you can sort of think about unprecedented change. Um, Brexit, and I won't labor the point, we've had an expert uh, and a ministerial and, yeah, and yesterday from uh, Michael Gove, a lot of chat about this. All I would say is that I, I think when I look at, say, banking as a regulated industry, um, which is, has had a sort of series of regulatory crises, you're about to experience something quite existential as these regulations change. And I think the words um, that Secretary of State has said are genuinely held, and he is um, sincere, and he wants to move us to a, a different set of regulatory arrangements, because we have to. The CAP disappears. Under any scenario, I don't think we're going to be in the CAP. So imagine all your regulatory landscape changing, and how do you react to that, and what, what does that do for you? And the answer is it is a colossal change, and I think you have to not assume that any of the previous structures are replicated in the future structures. And secondly, it, it is a change that I'm afraid is going to take a very long time. Um, there's been 40 years of EU um, build up for this. There's been a lot of detailed work. Replacing that overnight is going to be long and slow, even though the groundwork's already been laid with the various bills. But this is a process of regulatory change that's going to go on for a long time. And when people ask for certainty and details, I completely understand that. I have to tell you, a lot of that is just not possible because you don't know until you get to the next or the third or the fourth or the fifth stages. So there's going to have to be a lot of, um, again, flexibility and adaptability as this clarification of the regulation, the regulatory world comes along. And that's before you get to the trade deals. And the trade deals, I think, are a whole new level of complexity, which will affect certain sectors, obviously, more than others. But I think to echo um, Sir Lockwood's view, I mean, if it, the big complicated deals are 20-year deals. Some of the other deals should be easier, and we do start from convergence. We're not starting from somewhere else. But the overwhelming challenge is going to be that this change is going to be very murky. Uh, Michael talked yesterday about turbulence. I think this is going to be an extraordinarily difficult time because everyone wants answers, but frankly, they do not exist. And anyone who promises you quick answers is basically making it up. So it puts the initiative on us driving businesses or driving our own and, uh, enterprises to work out what we want to do, what we can do within uncertainty, because it would be lovely to have the uncertainty taken away by a magic wand. It's not going to happen. The second element of, of what's driving change is going to be the technology shifts. Now, again, Secretary of State talked a lot about the new tech in the agricultural world. Um, I think, uh, speaking from an industry that's just gone through a massive disruption, in the shape of retail. We're now seeing it with banking, uh, huge disruption. If you'd ask anyone in HSBC or Barclays back in 2007, did their business plan include something called an iPhone? Because I'm pretty sure it didn't. This year, we've got 10 million people banking on iPhone, uh, on, on our smartphones of various descriptions. And that innovation from the tech world has completely upended our entire business model, all our cost structures, what we can do for customers. And actually, I think in a good way, but it does mean that you didn't start and control the tech. You had to work out what it meant for your industry. So I would look now at tech as being a massive accelerator of change. And the difference, the Internet of Things and broadband, and God forbid, even broadband in rural areas, possibly, um, is going to make is quite fundamental. And I think this is at the, we're at the beginning of that tech transformation rather than the end of the tech transformation. So you know, regulatory change tech change, and then customers. Customers are changing at warp speed as well. We see shifts now, again, through social media, going much, much faster uh, and much more pervasive, and in a good way, opening up consumers around the world who perhaps weren't aware of things and uh, will represent future markets and customers for you. But if I take some of the obvious trends, the shift in diet that's happening, we will definitely see you know, further evolution of, of a more vegetarian, less, less meat-based uh, consumer diet. There will be, on the other hand, I think, strong requirement for quality, provenance, uh, air, interest in the story, the communities behind the product. And through social media and some of the tech opportunities, you can now turn these into customer realities, which were previously very distant. So I think the customer is actually going to be more positive for the industry than perhaps people think. Now, just um, for the last two themes, focus on the customer. Sounds very simple. Um, 
clearly the customers uh, are more interested now in reaching you direct, and actually the, the internet is a massive um, accelerator of that. But there has to be something that, that really resonates for them. And I think we, uh, I've seen certainly in, in, the, in the process of working on the commission, some really brilliant examples of small, people try, small farmers trying things which are new and different, but being able to test them with customers. And if I could encourage you to sort of think about the two things are, why is something what you, that you're doing different and interesting? And secondly, have you actually talked to any customers? Have you tried this? Have you tested it somewhere? Because you know very rarely in business can you ever going to get it right first time. It's always a continual process of evolution and testing. And the customer's always got something interesting and different to tell you. And the day you stop learning from your customer is the day your business stops evolving and growing. So really get into, well, what is it that would, would, would delight them and, and, and be interesting? And don't just listen to they want X, because uh, the famous Henry Ford, if you listen to the customer in a stupid way, what they want, that what he delivered them, would have given them as a faster horse. What they actually want is to be shown something and interact with them and understand what you can do, what they can do, and they will always give you an insight. So that focus on the customer, I think, is, is fundamental. The public customer, I think this debate is about to open up. What on earth does public goods actually mean? And it's one of the challenges we've had with the Commission about well, what, is the, what does that mean? Is it soil you know, health? Is it biodiversity? Is it something else that's, um, that we haven't even thought about yet? Um, and the answer is it's very different from an upland, for an upland um, sheep farmer to somebody um, doing arable in East Anglia. But I think what will be clear in that debate with the customer is much more a broader set of issues. And, and the two I would just sort of flag up for you is I do think there's going to be a more systemic view of how money, public money going into areas that, of which farming is a part of it. And we should also think about the money that the water firms are putting into treatment, et cetera, all the other flows in the economy. Um, there will be a question saying, what about public health? What's the relationship between food production, diet, and public health, which is an incredibly difficult minefield, um, but is one we should now have the debate. And it's the liberating fact of leaving the EU is that for the first time we can have a debate about what CAP, uh, what, what replaces CAP. And I think there is a huge opportunity for a, a really engaged public debate about, well, what is the systemic view of what we want that system to produce? And what are the really valuable public goods, including tricky things like access, as has been discussed. And I have seen this you know, debate being sidelined in the past. So I did some work on ecosystem services uh, four or five years ago. And actually, the, the answer was, well, you can't touch any of that because it's the CAP. That, that whole excuse is gone. This is a really important area to engage with. And again, I know Maness and others have been talking about how to make sure we shape this next system. And I think there is desire for the government, even with the WTO complications, to continue to support these sort of different types of environmental services and ELMs. What I think it has to now get to is, well, what do they actually mean? And how on earth do you measure them, given the challenges that some of the, the payment agency realities that, that we've all seen are? How do we turn that from a sort of desire to actual money being, being changed hands? I think there is a massive opportunity here that we need to get behind. And I think we need to have a real debate about how broad those areas are, including the role that farming plays in, in the public health agenda. Final two points, resilience and adaptability. Um, I mean, saying that to a room full of farmers is really is telling granny to suck eggs, um, because I, I know that's sort of mostly what you do. But I think it is um, a challenge to think quite deeply about what is the source of resilience in your business? You know, how dependent are you on certain areas? Have you got enough diversity of income flow? Do you understand how much capital is tied up in the various areas of the business? Where could you work to leverage existing capital? How do you think about resilience in a really fundamental way, not in a sort of box-ticking risk management uh, sense? And that is tied to adaptability. And adaptability is, I think, one of the biggest shifts I've seen in the business world in the last five years. What used to be an advantage of scale has turned into a disadvantage of slowness, because you can't change fast enough, you can't adapt fast enough. If you can combine, to my mind, many of the benefits we've seen with the co-op type, type arrangements that Mark talked about earlier, small-scale flexible businesses, but coming together to collaborate to create scale where it's useful, but not where it becomes a disadvantage. And I think in the business world, you're going to see a series of previous giants disappearing because they weren't adaptable enough. They couldn't change. They couldn't move out of the legacy businesses they were in, shed the old skin of the dinosaur, and move. 
And adaptability, if I could leave you with one message from the business world, is adaptability is the single most valuable thing any business can have. And even in a business rooted so strongly in tradition as farming, I think that is a great, great set of opportunities for us to go on to. Thank you very much. I'll see you.